Something really cool happened to me this week. I was clearing out a space in the Friendship Hall for us to store all of our new Christmas decorations. And when I was doing so, look what I found. I found these two little children's masks. The sheep and the goat. And so what I did was I had these on my desk all week as I was preparing my holly for today. And I just kind of stared at them. And you know, this story, I thought, oh, how do you really explain it to children? Other than saying, if you're a good sheep and you follow the shepherd and you do what the shepherd says, well, then you're going to get into heaven. But if you're that bad goat and you go off and do your own thing because you think you know better, well, then you're going to end up in hell. Now, sadly, I think for many of us, we have not moved past that childish understanding of this gospel message. Not only this gospel message, but our concepts of God and what heaven and hell is. I think so many of us still believe the childish notions that we were taught but you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But now that I'm an adult, I put all those childish ways behind. And what I want us to do is I want to put those childish notions behind. So many of us still have a very elementary school understanding of these biblical concepts. And we need a higher education. We need to move from that elementary understanding to seeing things from a higher perspective, which is what Jesus wanted us to do. Maybe you still have an elementary concept of God. Maybe this gospel passage, maybe you really believe that. Maybe you believe that the people who do good things will get into heaven, and the people who do bad things, they're going to spend eternity in the fire pits of hell. I have a very difficult uh, way of understanding that, because to me, the God that I've gotten to know through Jesus is a God of such great love that I can't imagine God casting anyone into eternal fire. So what actually is this gospel all about? You know, last Sunday, we heard that the people who don't share their talents are also cast into darkness. And we heard that nasty gnashing of the teeth. <laughs> what do these things mean? What are they about? Well, let's talk about the concept of heaven first. I've shared with you before Jesus never said, never, that heaven was a place we go to after we die. If you still have that childish notion, it's time for a higher education. Jesus, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means it's right now is when it is. So to have a concept of heaven that's that way, it would reason that hell would also not be a place that you go to after you die. Maybe heaven and hell are states of consciousness, states of being right now that we choose. God doesn't send us there. You choose it. So if you choose to follow the shepherd and stay connected to God, well, then you're going to live a life of peace, joy, and love, and you're going to be in heaven right now. But if you choose, like the goat, to go off your own way because you think you know better, well, then you're going to live in anxiety and fear and doubt, and you're going to be living a hellish state. But you sent yourself there. That's what Jesus is getting at in this message. God isn't casting you into darkness. You've cast yourself into darkness. 
Many of us still have a concept of God as being like Santa Claus, where it's, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows, that you're <laughs> he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And we really think that God keeps a checklist of our wrongdoings and our right doings. And when we die, God's going to say, well, boy, this list of wrongdoings is much longer than the list of right doings, so you go to the other place. You don't get to come in with me. I really would like us to move past that level of understanding because that is not at all what Jesus was teaching us. And that's not at all what this parable or this story is all about. This parable in Matthew's gospel is Jesus' last parable to his followers before he's going to be arrested and crucified. So he knows that he's not going to be with them physically much longer. So he wants to give him a really important last story. And the story is, when you take care of the sick, when you visit people in prison, when you feed the hungry and clothe the naked, you're doing it for me, and I'm there. You want to experience me after I'm gone? That's where you're going to experience me. When you do all of those things, that's where I'm going to come alive in those moments. That's where I'm going to be. In the epistle this week, I had a quote from Mother Teresa, and she said, at the end of our life, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we've received, how much money we've made, how many great things we've done. We will be judged by, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was homeless. And you took me in. And notice she doesn't say, at the end of our lives, God will judge us. The concept of judge, we have to really also review. A judge, in our understanding today, is somebody who has to decide whether someone's going to be pardoned and set free, or is going to be punished and thrown into jail. But God wants everybody to be pardoned and set free. God is not going to send anybody into prison and eternal damnation. This is a loving God. I know this is hard to grasp our heads around, but if you think about a trial, God loves the parents of the child who was murdered just as much as God loves the person who murdered their child. God loves them equally. And that is why God is going to love you whether you feed the hungry or not, whether you clothe the sick or not. God's not going to love you better because you did it. God loves you the same. Think about the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son went off and lived a horrible life. But when he came home, the father didn't say, you're punished, and I'm going to banish you. I don't want anything to do with you. What does the father do? The father throws a party for him, a big celebration for him. That's what God does for us. So now you may say, well, if God's going to love me anyway, whether I feed the hungry or not, then why do it? Why am I doing it? Because we want to experience God in our midst. It's not for God. It's for us. We want to experience God. And Jesus said, when you do that for them, you're doing it for me. And that's where you're going to experience me. That's why we do it. The words of Richard Rohr that Robert read for us this morning, I think, are just so perfect for this because he's saying that those who are considered least by our society, it's those people who reveal God to us. I love those words of his. He says, those who are considered least by society are those who are in a privileged and revelatory position. They are to be honored, for they reveal God to us. 
And oftentimes we still have a very childish way of viewing the least of these. And sometimes when you hear on the evening news some of these talking heads, they sound very childish when talking about the least of these. And they'll say, well, why should we be giving these people free health care? Why should we be allowing them to be citizens? Why should we give them the right to be married? Uh, if only they would work hard enough. It's their own fault that they got them I got themselves in this situation. Why should we give them free handouts? It's like a little kid with his ball. This is mine. You go get your own. It's very, very childish to look at the least of these from that perspective. Now, this week, Google Doodles, I don't know if you know, when you go onto Google's homepage, sometimes they have a little doodle that honors somebody. And this week, they honored a 20th century pop artist whose name was Corita Kent. And she was also known as Sister Corita because she was a Catholic nun. And the doodle that they used was one of her pieces of art. And it was a quote by her. And it said, to understand is to stand under, which is to look up to which is a good way to understand. I want to say that again because I think it's important. If you want to understand the situation of the least of these, you don't want to look at it from above, looking down. How did you get yourself in that situation? If only you would have gotten a job, you would have been in a better place. Okay? Sister Karina is saying to understand means to stand under to be below the least of these, and she says, and it's to look up to them. They're at a place of privilege, like Richard Rohr said. They are going to reveal God to you. That's the best way to understand somebody's situation, is to stand under them, not <coughs> above them. And I'm reminded of this when I look up and I see the geese flying in the V formation. And they fly in the V formation because they're helping one another. They can fly higher and faster and quicker. And they don't have to flap their wings as much if they, as if they were flying alone. That they're able to help one another. And there's no leader. They all take turns in that leadership position, if you will, that front position. They all take turns and help each other. And you know, they honk in order to encourage one another to keep going. And you know that if one of them is sick and falls to the ground, two other in the formation fly down to be with it until it's better or until it dies. This, to me, is a great example of what Jesus is talking about in this gospel is that we're all here to help one another to fly higher we're all here to encourage one another we're all here to be with one another when we're sick this is what we're being called to do now we have two perfect examples of this community doing that right in front of you we have the bags of flour this is just a small sample of the bags of flour we've collected. We've collected hundreds and hundreds of bags just from this small little church. The same thing with this tree, with clothing. There are only five hearts left. That's how generous you all, you all have been. <laughs> I want to encourage us to also not just look at the hungry and the naked in physical terms. Because to feed the hungry may need to feed someone who's hungry for companionship. Or someone may be thirsting for love. There may be someone who is imprisoned by loneliness. So expand your concept of what Jesus is saying here about feeding and clothing and visiting those who are imprisoned. 